Hey guys, Winston at Carbide3D here. A surprisingly common question we get from the woodworking community is, can you make a branding iron on the shape Oko? It's kind of a given on the Nomad because of its precision and lead screw driven axes, but people often wonder about the belt drive system and accuracy on the shape Oko. Is it good enough to do something similar? Can it actually machine fine features in metal? And not just aluminum, what about brass? Well, you probably saw the thumbnail, so you know how this is going to end. Let me just say this up front. Yes, you can totally make a branding iron on the shape Oko. Now here's how I made one with the Carbide 3D logo. You can use any CAD and CAM software you want to do this, including Carbide Create, but there are some tricks in Fusion 360 that I leveraged for extra detail and precision, so that's what I'll be demonstrating today. I'll be milling the Carbide 3D logo into some brass blanks I turned on a cheap desktop mini lathe. They're segments of 1 inch diameter rod stock with a hole in one side drilled and tapped so I can stick it on a threaded rod. It's a pretty simple piece but you can also use bar or plate stock, but you will need to make sure you have a way to attach these blanks to a handle. In this case, I'll also be leveraging that tapped hole to secure my brass branding iron blank to my CNC. A single bolt isn't the strongest connection in the world, but my tool pads won't be too aggressive. This should provide a strong enough interface for my purposes. And to find my zero for this setup, I'm going to use a bit of paper and some math to figure out where my center point is in both X and Y. If you touch off on any two points on a line across a circle, you can deduce the center point of that line. In Fusion, I'll start by sketching out a circle which I will then extrude into a cylinder to represent my stock. On top of this cylinder, I'll start a new sketch and bring in my logo as an SVG. I suggest an SVG over DXF in this case because you get options in the import menu to reverse your logo, which is important because a branding iron flips the image that it transfers. I'll select the region I want to leave proud and extrude down the rest of the material by about a sixteenth of an inch. And that's really all I need to do for this model, but I will add one more feature, which is a pair of flats to the top and bottom of the branding iron. This helps you gauge the orientation of the iron when you go to stamp something. Now, this feature doesn't need to terminate in a radius, but I just think it looks cool, so I'm keeping it that way. Moving into the manufacturing workspace, I'll set things up by informing Fusion that my stock is not a rectilinear prism, but in fact a cylinder with a diameter of 1 inch. I'll actually provide a bit of positive tolerance on that dimension just in case, so 1.01 inches. And I'll want to trim off a couple thousandths of an inch off the top when I flatten things out. Now I can begin adding toolpaths. The first order of business is to ensure our stock top is flat and where we expect it to be. To do that, I'll apply a facing toolpath using an eighth inch end mill like our 274Z. For speeds and feeds using standard 2D toolpaths like facing, pocketing, and contouring, we need to do some extrapolation. If you do a little research about the mechanical properties of brass, specifically the C360 alloy, you'll find that it's about 50% stronger than aluminum on a per unit volume basis. So my rule of thumb is to reduce the aggressiveness of my cutting parameters by somewhere between one third and one half compared to what I would use for 6061 aluminum. The closest comparable aluminum recipe I have written down for the 274Z says to go for a depth of cut of about 0.012 inches and feed at 20 inches per minute, assuming 10,000 RPM. I'm going to aim for a depth of cut in brass of about 0.008 inches and feed at 15 inches per minute. However, if you crank up the RPM, you can usually raise the feed rate proportionally. So at 18,000 RPM, I would feed at about 27 inches per minute. And I have a bit of margin for error here because that facing toolpath will cut shallower than 8 thou. Next up, I'm going to use a 3D adaptive clear on the entire branding iron head stopping at the bottom of my flat sides. Because Fusion knows exactly where the stock is, it can spiral inward from the outside. There's no need for specialized ramping to ease into a cut and the end mill never has to plunge vertically into material, which is great. I'm leaving 10 thou of radial stock to leave and half of that in axial. 18,000 RPM, 27 inches per minute, a 0.03 inch depth of cut, and a 0.01 inch optimal load. And once that's done, I can use pocketing and contour toolpaths to clean up the exposed flat faces. Next, I need to clean up that radius area on the side. And since I blended it into the body of the branding iron with a radius of exactly 0.125 inches, I'll need a ball nose end mill of a quarter inch diameter to finish it off, specifically the 202 ball end mill. I'm using a 2D contour path and manually specifying the final toolpath depth to properly match the radii. I'll be going slow and steady at 10,000 RPM, 
15 inches per minute and a single step down, though I am using two roughing passes to creep up on the final dimensions and minimize the potential for chatter. To mill out the inside of the carbide logo, which is too narrow for an 8th inch end mill, I'll switch to a 1 16th inch end mill. Again, I'm using an aluminum recipe that's 30% less aggressive in feed rate and depth of cut versus in aluminum, but then also sped up to account for the higher RPM I'll be using. I left some stock to leave here so I could use a finishing toolpath to achieve the nicest possible surface finish. That's just me being picky, however, there's no reason the walls need to be pristine and shiny, the only thing that matters is the surface finish that's going to be touching the wood. That leaves us with a logo that's 99% machined out, but at the tips of the C, there is some material that's too tight to mill out with a 1 16th inch end mill. In fact, you can't even properly define it with a 1 32nd inch end mill. You can get close, but not perfect. And that's where using a tapered end mill comes in handy. You can apply a 2D contour using something like our 501 PCB engraver, and through multiple step downs, Fusion will calculate a tool path that respects the changing diameter of the tool. I'll select the corner of the C to machine and add in some tangential extension. This just means that the toolpath will start cutting a little before and after the segment I've selected. At the shallowest step down of the toolpath, the engraver will fully define the corners of the C. At the deeper depths, it will automatically move further away from the corner so that the rest of the end mill fits without cutting into the logo. In the actual implementation of this toolpath, however, you can see that the PCB engraver cut away a little bit too much material. This is because any wear or erosion of a well-used end mill will cause a touch probe or tool length probe to overestimate how deep to cut. The tip that would otherwise trigger the probe isn't there, so the fatter portions of the end mill end up being lower than planned. And that's why a little extra material was removed here. For toolpaths involving tapered or variable diameter cutters like engravers or chamfer mills, or even roundover cutters, it's best to leave a couple thou of stock to leave to compensate for this kind of potential error. And there you have it. This kind of branding iron is fairly chunky and simplistic, but it's also very easy to make in a modest garage shop. It also retains a ton of thermal energy because of its density, so one heat will mark a ton of wood. Hope this gives you some ideas and inspiration for projects, and also reassures you that a belt-driven XY gantry system can be quite capable with some smart planning and toolpathing. Good luck and have fun machining, folks.